Hey everyone, it's Nick Mike Lack here along with Mr. Steve Frazier. Hello again. For another commentary in the Nightmare in Elm Street series today, the uh, controversial, I'd say, Freddy's Revenge. The sequel. Very, very, very interesting stuff to get into here, but uh, obviously this is an audio-only commentary, so we be no video accompanying this. So guys, if you want to sync this up with your own copy of the film, put the timestamp to zero and then press play right about now. Now, <laughs> a little lag there. <sighs> but yeah, I mean, like I said, this is this runs the full spectrum with the fans. I mean, there's some people who absolutely hate it, some people who really appreciate it, and everything in between. Absolutely, I've grown to like it more over the years. Um, I actually really love this music. Um, I don't know who did the score in this one off the top uh, of my head. Christopher Young, who did uh, Hellraiser later on. Okay. Um, I, the the theme of this one, I think, is actually really haunting. Yeah. Um, and they do not use any Bernstein music in this. None. Uh, none of it. None whatsoever. Uh, here we go. Freddy's Revenge. <laughs> Again. Part two, which now people kind of credit like part two, which is interesting. And it's weird that they did the scratchy thing and yeah. then just put up those block letters. Yeah, it's kind of very, very 80s. Very mid-80s. <laughs> this doesn't look like the same neighborhood. <laughs> This doesn't look like California. I don't yeah. know where they filmed this, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Here's a great I'm cameo sure. cameo by Robert out. Englund here. Yeah. yeah. Driving the bus. Just regular old Rob. No makeup today. <laughs> I'm sure he loved that. Oh, relished it. And <laughs> right, right over the grid, then you pop over and see... Uh, yep. You know, on the screen, that's kind of... The little know, slightly meta. <laughs> sure. Yeah, because he, he gave the little salute little there. On screen credit there. Right. So, oh, and there's our heroine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Mark Patton. Looking very emo. And in this dream sequence, he looks very emo. Sure, sure. <laughs> Although, at this point, we don't know it's a dream. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's... Oh, there, there's your guy, Christopher Young. Yeah, yeah. You said he did a Hellraiser? Uh, Hellraiser 1 and 2. Okay. And a couple other things. And then there. Oh, Jacques Haitken returns. Yeah. yeah. David Chaskin, <laughs> written by. He's the one to blame if you love it or hate it. <laughs> <laughs> who, who for years denied that he wrote any subtext of this, the homoeroticism of the film into it. And it just like, the last couple of years he just broke down and just admitted it. Right, was like, oh, by the way, I'm gay, everybody's gay. Um, welcome to the gay nightmare. Which yeah. is this film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a gay nightmare in Elm Street. And, uh, <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> we'll be seeing... Uh, Bob Shea, of course. We'll talk about him later. Sure. <laughs> His uh, on-screen yeah, he does, but, he does uh, get a cameo. Directed by Jack Shoulder, who I've always blamed for this film, probably and he, incorrectly. He, he continues to say in every single interview he had absolutely no idea that, of what, what, what the, the homoeroticism was in the film. But you, you think about it, because well, the more you know about the production of the film, that they, they got this out in the theaters just under a year after the release of the first film. So they're running so fast that sometimes you just don't have time to stop and realize it sure. to, to really kind of get that objective point of view to see exactly what you're making. Sometimes it's just like, this is what you have to do and just keep going at it. Here's where we kind of figure out that yeah. we're in a dream sequence. Yeah. And now the bus is driving into the desert? <laughs> I guess that would be California. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure it was. Which is odd, considering at the time New Line was based in New York. They're headquarters and everything. Obviously, later on, they'd move to L.A. and everything, but... Sure. Cactus? Who knows? Well, it's a dream. You can do whatever you want. It could dream. be Arizona. It could be California. Sure. Whatnot. And actually, here's... Uh, where they had the best tax breaks. Right. Right. And here's where we see Springwood High School on the side of the bus, yeah. which is the first this mention is, of mm -hmm. where you're at. Yeah, this is the first time that they really kind of put a nail on, on the head of it, saying, this is the town, this is where... I don't know if they specifically say Ohio in this film. That might be a later sequel. I'm not entirely certain. I feel so, like the Ohio didn't come until like six. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I know it's prominently mentioned in Freddy's Dead. Everything else might just be implied that it's Midwest, but who knows? Sure. I always thought this was a really cool kind of gag, I mean, trick or whatever the. Regardless of the script problems or anything else in the film, I think there's a lot of good effects work in it between like just makeup effects and just kind of stuff like this where you're going to end up using miniatures here in a second and just some inventive visuals in the film. Sure. I mean, I feel like this is kind of a 
a bigger production. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they did have more money on it, almost like double the budget at least. It's right. Somewhere between like two and three million dollars they had, where the first one was only about one million. And I think that they did gross a little bit more money than the first film. It was like another I think so. million over 25 was the first film. So despite what anyone else kind of thinks of the film, even the reviews at the time were very poor because it, the people loved the first film so much. They went out to this see the just, second one. It just garnered enough goodwill to, to generate the box office. And so here we've got this guy who has no relation to the first film. Yeah. And I find it interesting, actually, that... Ah, oh, there, there it is. There you go, baby. Notice the stripes on the sleeves of the sweater. Yeah. Really kind of, oddly enough, cleaned up the look a little bit. Maybe make... I don't know what the motivation was behind that. I know they had different makeup effects well, guy on the film, but... you know, Freddie became, became the star. Yeah. Even, you know, after the first film, they said, Oh, look, we've got a, a villain that, that we can really capitalize on. Mm -hmm. So even in the video art, um, you know, the on the VHS tape, it, mm -hmm. it was basically his face. Yeah, they didn't use the poster artwork. They just put a big kind of photographic image right. of him on and there. And so they went from, you know, a picture of, you know, kind of the overtone of him in the background to mm -hmm. him being front the, and center. Front and center, right. Um, and we've already seen his face more in this film in the yeah. first five minutes than we have pretty yeah. much almost the whole... The first film, yeah. Right. <laughs> what a great segue. Yeah, uh, this, this film uses a little bit more humor, I think. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Not not at Freddy's expense, but some of the other characters in the film have a bit more Whew. beats like that. But So, uh, <laughs> again, you know, here we have no tie to the first film no. with any of the characters. So, you know, people are going, oh, I like that Freddy guy. That was a great movie. Let me mm -hmm. Maybe we'll find out what happens to Nancy if we go yeah. see this one. <laughs> nope. No. You don't. You get this guy. Yeah. And even in interviews and everything, they don't even remember if they even considered calling Heather Elaine Camp or anyone else from the first one. They just figured, let's just develop a new story and just move on from there. And, they, and even the whole thing of not even thinking Robert England needed to come back. They could just stick anyone in the sure. outfit and make it happen. But that went very poorly. At least they realized that much and then take them, shoot themselves in the foot. Well, so obviously, Wes, Wes Craven said, I don't really want to do a sequel. Yeah, he, didn't, he felt like he had a complete story with the first film. I didn't think there was any need to extend it. Here's uh, Daddy Clue. <laughs> Clue Gulliger. Who, I mean, another mm -hmm. like well-respected, again, almost a top-billing yeah. kind of situation. And I think it was the same year he was in Return of the Living Dead, which he was fantastic in as well. Right, yeah. So. It was. If it wasn't the same year, it was right around the yeah, same time. Yeah, I think it was 85 as well. We get a little, a little tongue in cheek. Uh, <laughs> the sister gets the Fu Manchu fingers out of the. <laughs> very. Uh, <laughs> great look on him. Great nice. eighties look. Yeah, yeah, Good eighties yeah. hair. The hair definitely pops it out in kind of the pastel shirt, and whatnot. And we got the note to call Rhonda on the phone. <laughs> Doesn't even look like the same house. No. It, well, it, this this is the first point. Oh, here's our. Our yeah, Kim Myers, who was su supposedly hired because she's bared a resemblance to Meryl Streep. I don't know. Absolutely. What, I, well, I won't deny that. I don't know what they're thinking. was like, oh, she looks like Meryl Streep. Let's put her in a Nightmare on the Street movie. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll confuse people. We'll de-age Meryl Streep by 15 years. I think if you, if you have somebody that looks like Meryl Streep, they're automatically a winner. And you just say, oh, yeah. well, I got a pretty gal. Yeah, she is. And, okay, so this kid is now living in the same... Oh, there's Springwood, Springwood High, High School. School. Yeah. Living in the same house that from the first one. Mm-hmm. And here we're going to meet Robert Russler, uh -huh. who is a fan favorite um, yeah. as far as personalities go. <laughs> and uh, apparently he uh, auditioned for the film on, like, the last day of filming on Weird Science. And okay. And Robert Downey Jr. actually drove him to the audition. That's a fun little fact. <laughs> yeah. There's always some uh, some good sports scenes in these these '80s movies. <laughs> yeah. And what are the girls doing? Are they actually they're Suspense. playing archery? Is that the guys play softball? And, oh, oh, right plonked. in the noggin. He was in high school. I I just I just cowered in fear. I didn't catch anything. I just backed away and ran away. <laughs> I don't know what he was distracted by. 
I don't know. He just zoned out, I guess. Maybe not enough sleep because Freddy's been spooking his dreams. Sure, sure. Yeah. A good uh, Adidas plug there. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't pay for that. Product placement. <laughs> Probably not. Not then. Nah. 80s, they, they weren't... Uh, you could throw products in there and no one would really do anything. Today is so difficult to get away with that because everyone's got litigation departments. But And this is gym class yeah. in 1985. <laughs> yep. I think he's out. He's out and didn't touch the plate. Oh, and oh, there's oh, his there, ass. There's a... <laughs> it's we, just, have, we have the first moment of Male ass. ass. <laughs> there's a lot of male ass to come if you haven't... Well, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of skin and it's not uh, feminine right. <laughs> in this film. <clears throat> well, there's a lawsuit today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hit the showers. Oh no, not the oh, showers not yet. yet, man. Not they yet. Got, we gotta we gotta do Do a thousand of them. <laughs> and they're gonna do another thousand. Uh. Smoking in high school. <laughs> there you go. I like it. Smoking in a movie period. You can't get that done today. Probably not, no. Not typically. I mean even James Bond doesn't smoke anymore. Really? Yeah, I they, didn't even I didn't even yeah, notice they, that. I think they I don't stop that like after Aside from cigars, I think they stopped that sometime in the Brosnan era. I never even noticed. Mm -hmm. Here's, uh, like, we've started to develop the friendship here between yeah. the two. Obviously, she seems to be friendly. She rides to school mm -hmm. with this guy. And, and I'll say, uh, she's a nicely looking woman, but again, kind of carry on from Heather Lincoln. She's not the typical Hollywood film Sure. Bomb or whatnot, you know. She's very comfortable, very approachable type of young woman or whatnot. She just has that again, another girl next door feel, which I like. She doesn't seem overly oh, glamorous. There's another or whatnot. no running. No they, running. They really love no running in this series. <laughs> no running. Here's the reveal, the link to the first film. Yeah. say Mark Pan just has a great haunted look about throughout he does. most of the film. He does. Well, I mean, we'll get on to his better scenes later on, it's just heavier scenes, but I think he does a really good performance in the film. He's just very intense. Here's uh, the red door. The red so door. The blue door. Um, still bars on the top windows. That's, yeah, that's curious. They've taken them off the bottom windows. Hmm. And I guess we're. Oh, there's a Coke. Again, another product oh. placement, which may or may not be. Uh, yeah. So at this point, I don't know if he is actively trying not to sleep. Or just insomniac or what. Yeah, just restless. And is he wearing scrubs? <laughs> is he a nurse? <laughs> kind of looks like He's got nope. a pocket tee and everything. It looks nope. like it. Nobody called Rhonda. Nobody called Rhonda. <laughs> Oh, oh little, an ominous little subtle thing. So they're playing with the the surrealism a little bit. Sure, yeah. sure. Which I assume now that we we've seen Freddy, we know we're yeah. in a dream. And this, so. and again, this shot is very reminiscent of the first film in a certain way. I mean, when Amanda Weiss's character is going outside and into the garden, and everything. Yeah, down the hallway or or the alley rather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of shots in here that look just like the first film and that's likely because they have the same cinematographer so that, that that's a good because they did try to bring a lot of the same people over they had the again same cinematographer and they also had the same production designer who apparently he designed everything but because he felt his department was underfunded he decided to depart the film and someone else took over for him when production began so they did try to bring as many people over but even like i said the effects guy was different because uh david miller from the first film he had just done the first film. We felt like he needed some time off or do something else. The, uh, Here's Freddy reaching mm -hmm. into the... Getting his razors back <laughs> that old Marge took from him. From oh, Marge. Margey Marge. Dirty Marge. Dead Marge, <laughs> I assume. I don't know. Drunk we've, Marge. We've not actually referenced anybody from the first film no. other than that scene where... And we'll get a few more ties a little later on when he discovers the diary. Sure. 
So now, which is odd because in no point in the first one there really was a diary, so it's right. just making its own tenuous connections at some points. Right. Somebody, you can write any, you can connect anything with a yeah. line of dialogue. Yeah. Like, oh, how about we have a diary? Uh-huh. So they've just moved into this house. You got a lot of shit. <laughs> And here, again, we're about to have Freddy vocals that he really didn't talk a lot in the first film. Not too and much. And at this, at this stage here... There we go. He's become the star. Yeah. That's a very homosexual line. Yeah. Nice little sort of morticia eyes there. <laughs> a but again, a lot, a lot more close-up of, yeah. of his face. And new mega effects due to Kevin Yeager. We go on to direct Hellraiser 4 and then disown the film. Because <laughs> <laughs> apparently Kevin Yeager came on and decided he didn't have a lot of reference material from the first film, so he just kind of decided to slightly alter the design a little sure. bit and make it a little bit more... Uh, skeletal or whatnot. <clears throat> We've already had two giant screams out of this man. Mm-hmm. Um, who I guess that's a, a decent segue. Um, Mark Patton, the actor, is currently mm-hmm. uh, working on a documentary yeah. uh, that is called Scream Queen. Mm-hmm. Actually, it's Scream Comma Queen uh, about <laughs> being uh, being a the homosexual. Male, yeah, male scream queen, as he calls himself. Sure. Um, that is due out sometime mm-hmm. in 2017. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that, you know, he's written as the, you know, the role of the survivor girl almost yeah. in this film. And, you know, of course, everyone involved at the film at the time was like, oh, we're, we just changed it up and, you know, different, yeah. different main character. You yeah, know. I mean, everyone aside from the screenwriter kind of didn't really think much about it, but... And like I said, they were probably they were moving so fast, and Bob Shear is micromanaging things so much. You got so much what's right on the film. There's so much stress. You're not really getting that outside perspective out. Oh, that's what we're doing. Sure. <laughs> and here he's going to nod off again, which means potential for another dream. Mm-hmm. No, Robert Russler. He's a he's a good-looking guy, I guess. He it, it, it does, it does look quite a bit older than Mark Patton, though, I'll say. He seems a little bit more college age than teenage age. But. I feel like everybody back then looked older. You know, you were 22 yeah. and playing a teenager. Yeah. Oh, that creeped me out, man. Just just being on set with a snake wrapped around me would freak me out. Oh, I don't mind snakes. <laughs> I, I think uh, I could do this. I don't know. <laughs> I'd have a shiver up my spine or two, I'm sure. So, this is a, an interesting little move here where we think that there's something bad happening in a dream sequence, and that was actually mm-hmm. what really happened. Mm. Yeah. And it wasn't a dream after all, really. <laughs> I don't know why he's insinuating that Robert Russler put the snake on him, because obviously he <laughs> sat in his seat yeah. the whole time. Well, she's got some money, huh? Yeah, that's a pretty nice place. It's an state. estate. <laughs> yes, indeed. That is an estate. I think she's attractive. Yeah. This pool will come into play later on, as you oh, know. Oh, indeed. We'll get to that. <laughs> that's a god awful looking couch. That is it. Are those pheasants? Those are pheasants on the couch. Well, apparently like birds, because we'll get to that scene. The sure, sure. Well, scene here's a couple of parakeets right there. <laughs> the parakeet and a, and a, scene, we'll get to that shit. And a puzzle that's undone on the dining room table. Yeah. Coffee table. Weird. Well, here comes oh. a fun little scene. Oh, is it this scene? He's telling him to clean up his room. Sure. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, uh, how many hits does this one have? How many hits does this clip have on YouTube? I, you know what? Okay, I will say a lot. I will say... We this go. is a great song. Oh. I love 80s. I oh. love I love 80s music. You and I both. 
This is a such a fun song. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll show you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> We're about to get some thrusting. Oh. I, buying the soundtrack is worth, you know, this song. Oh, there go. there's some butt bumping. We've got... So... <laughs> now... Only in the 80s. We got a, we got the the pop gun. Oh yeah. Oh. This is this. <laughs> Outstanding. It's like Top Gun. You have nothing on this movie. Very embarrassing. Bowling ball on the shelf. Look at that. Who does that? How is um, that shield supported? That yeah. thing should be breaking in half. I don't even know. I'm sure it's plastic. So. No chicks out of town. Oh no! Or no, no out, of out of town, town chicks. chicks. Okay. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't know. Is that a thing? Didn't you just move into town? Don't <laughs> right. you want to meet anyone? Are, oh, well, <laughs> don't you want to have? You're the out of town over? chick. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So she's helped him clean up his room. Oh, Jack. Jack it. Uh, I, I don't think there's a mid that goes by in this movie without some kind of beat that's slightly homoerotic like the probe game that's the up in the <laughs> up in the in the closet i was recently at a thrift store where i, I came across a, a, a game of probe and i almost <laughs> bought it just out of homage just to this the film hell of having it right so here's this diary Throw it on ebay and say this is the one for him oh sure he's revenge damn it i could have made some money and you could get mark Patton to sign it and now there's make, an idea make a grand i'm so mad <laughs> So this diary's just been sitting up in his bed, and I guess you know, obviously he didn't put anything uh, away. It's new Coke. Oh, nice it is. It new is Coke. new Coke. Ah, uh, new Coke. What a time capsule this film is. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So, at this point, you know, oh, it's just sexual innuendo. She's referencing Glenn across the street, and yeah. I just love him. <laughs> Just that shirt, again. 80s. Exploding 80s. Because the first one didn't have a lot of stuff that seemed too dated in terms of fashion. This one just like, all the way out. Right. 80s are full bloom, just throw it all on the screen. And of course, you don't realize at the time, but 30 well, right. years later. Sure, you just, you kind of go, <laughs> well, dress in your everyday clothes. Yeah. So, here's a realization moment. You know, he's reading about Freddy... He says, oh, well, this is the guy that's been haunting me in my dreams. Yeah. It's a nice little moment. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to link one film to the other, I guess. Yeah. I didn't really care for that, though. You know, it, mm. I don't know. It's just, it's a weird, a weird segue it, 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 or transition from one can film. Feel, to, yeah, I can feel a little bit force of trying to have a connection there instead of having something that's completely disconnected from the first so it's it's a weird line to kind of ride there it's like you're making a completely new film with different characters but you don't want to feel like you're just completely ignoring the first film so you find try to find some middle ground to make that connection or whatnot well so all we've really done here is said that the connection is that he lives in the same house. Yeah. So, if you're using logic and reasoning, Freddy is, like, married to the house, which completely negates all of the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. you know, Clue and, and this gentleman's mm -hmm. mom had uh, nothing to do with the death yeah. of Fred Krueger. And like like I said in the, in the commentary of the first film, it's called Freddy's Revenge, but... He's never encountered any people before to get any revenge <laughs> on him, so it's 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 not how that really kind of conveys the film too well. But I don't know what well, else you could it, really put on without. Uh, it puts Freddy in the title. Yeah, and revenge yeah. is a good sequel word. Yeah, typically. So, so it's, it's more marketing than it is yeah. kind of uh, conveying a plot or whatnot, I guess. Then. Looks like 
looks like he's dreaming again, I would assume. Yeah. He's going to go into the basement here. You can see what kind of treasures mm -hmm. this family has brought into the home. <laughs> I feel like if it's that hot, you wouldn't wear a long you sleeve. Won't, you won't be wearing a sweater pant. or whatnot. Yeah, I mean, the guy keeps waking up in, in, a, in a gallon of sweat. <laughs> but, but, when you think about it, because, I mean, you never saw anyone like Nancy in the first film wake up that way. I mean, they'd certainly have violent wake ups, but they'd never be drenched in sweat. So maybe sure. that's even a thing, aside from horrorism, subtext, and everything. Maybe just showing that it's even more intense for him, that this is even more of a harrowing type of thing that's happening to him than what was going on in the first film, if you want to read it that deeply. So here he discovers the knives, which... And if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. they did use the same glove. I was wondering. Initially, um, and then somebody, they lost it. They lost the glove. Yeah, they lost it on this. On yeah, set. Yeah, because yeah, uh, Wes had it, and he gave it back to the production for them to use it, and then it got disappeared for like 20 some odd years. I, I don't know if it ever came back. I, I think I read today that it, they found it in like an auction or whatnot on eBay or something. Like 2011 or whatnot. Because that one looks, that one that he just had there looked like the same glove from one. So I don't know if that, mm -hmm. this scene was just early in the, yeah. in the production. Um, I guess we can be on the lookout for later on to see if there's, there's a noticeable kind of, difference. Yeah. Um, there were very noticeable differences in the gloves in later sequels. Mm -hmm. Oh, high school life, <laughs> 1985. Now, this has to be California because nowhere in the Midwest do you have outdoor lockers and hallways and whatnot. Sure. Even though it's billed as the Midwest later on. Yeah. Ooh, health and safety for you. <laughs> Setting up the big pool party coming yeah. up here. Indeed. It's going to be a good time. <laughs> So here again, we've got Kim Myers, who is very sweet, very sweet, and kissing him on the cheek. She wants to be with this guy, yeah. And his character is not gay. We mm -hmm. don't like we don't have a uh, any sort of overt knowledge that yeah. he's gay. Um, it's never brought up. Mm -hmm. Mark Patton, the actor, is gay. Yes, um, but that's completely irrelevant to the story. Yeah. Um, all they really have ever show is him not being interested in her. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, he friend zones her. Yeah. <laughs> and all she wants to do is get with him. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, in trouble again. Oh, we're back. Uh. Oh, oh, dear. <laughs> Super Moon! Uh. And there's our famed birds I would think this is one of the most famous scenes in the film ah. oh okay here here's the puzzle I was wondering why there was just a puzzle <laughs> half done but apparently the daughter working on it Clue's gonna go check the thermostat yeah, it's burning up in there yet he's wearing a long pant Nobody wears a short in this film except for the girl. Yeah, the girl. Yeah. And this is probably it's, one of the scenes that starts to kind of like twist around rules or whatnot because at, at no point were we really saying this is a dream sequence, but we're having some sort of scene that's supernatural. Supernatural, or... some kind of omen esque type of uh, moment in the film. And, of course, with this scene, there there was originally uh, some kind of big demonic parakeet design sure. for the whole thing, but for a reason why they don't didn't like it or they just want to go with something more simplistic. It was some kind of giant robot. Yeah, robotic. on a big stick or whatnot, yeah. <laughs> so now, <clears throat> this bird, which 
is completely innocuous, mm-hmm. is taking over the scene. Yeah. <laughs> And, and combusts. Um, and uh, to your point about the rules, mm-hmm. this is the first time that something weird has happened and nobody has been dreaming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the gas. It's the gas. Why would the gas, a gas leak... <laughs> Because a bird do suddenly explode sure. out of nowhere. Sure, the bird doesn't have a you know a spark coming out of its ass. <laughs> Fire breathing. See, turkey. Clue just said it. Birds <laughs> don't just explode. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> he's a bit of a klutz in this film. He's already got a bandaid on his face. He's gonna fall down a ladder later or something. Oh, right? I like it. <laughs> well, the bird, you know, came. Yeah. In. Oh yeah, it ha- scraped him. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Him yelling Jesse is is quite a it's kind of a running gag in the film because he's always just angry. <laughs> Almost court well, quarter to one in the morning. Mm-hmm. He's gotta stop drinking all that coke, man. It's keeping him up all night. I think it's the same coke. I'm pretty sure that he just hasn't cleaned up the coke for I'm sure, two, probably, three days ago. But... <laughs> and oh, now he's Z- called Zach Call. Oh well Zach Moore is called. <laughs> it could have been he's Zach Morris. Going... <laughs> I'm not sure. Somebody named Zach called. For who? I guess it's whoever. For... Oh, there Lightning we go. through the window? <laughs> What's happening? You're getting less subtle, Freddy, you know? You're getting a lot more overt with well, this. Well, we stuff. haven't seen Freddy in a while. <laughs> no, we haven't. Oh, there... shit. So, Mark Patton is. <laughs> Jesse. Jesse! Has now left his house in the middle of the night. Oh, boy. Here walking we go. in the rain, and he's going to walk into. The Blue Oyster from Police Academy. <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> Don's place. Very innocuous. Oh, boy. And what do we find in here? Bob Shane Leather. We see... That's Billy Idol. We have a gay bar. <laughs> I think that guy was in Poison. <laughs> Poison. I think that woman's a man. <laughs> C.C. DeVille. So... <laughs> <clears throat> We've written a gay bar <laughs> into the script. And he's walking in there all bare chested and everything. Dripping wet. From the rain. It's there's men <laughs> kissing men in the scene. There's <laughs> like <laughs> the, okay. There's plenty, obviously and there's obviously no doorman at this place either. <laughs> plenty of hold on. Okay, yeah, baby. This right here. <laughs> Is the head the, of the is, studio is the man who created Nightmare on Elm Street. Essentially, well, allowed Nightmare on Elm Street to be a success. The head of New Line Cinema in leathers, because Jack Shoulder didn't want to have him play uh, Robert Russell's father, so he gave him this role. And he went to some uh, leather joint in Hollywood or whatnot with his kids, like a sex t- shop, right? <laughs> yeah, and bought all kinds of bondage <laughs> things, it's like. Call up Rob Helford, why don't you? I mean, it'll fit in here perfectly. And now we've <laughs> now we've learned that the high school gym teacher is uh-huh. at least into leather and gay bars. He's into some kinky shit. And you got that little red on the corner there, which definitely is kind of suggesting something uh, surreal is going on, something a little bit more uh, hyper reality. Well, it would. It's interesting to me that. The gym teacher would, <laughs> the gay gym teacher would find the young student in the gay bar, mm-hmm. and then as punishment, take him to school and make him run laps. <laughs> run laps. How did they get there? Did they go in his car? <laughs> <laughs> and he changed, he changed clothes a little bit too, didn't? He? No, no. He's oh still, no, he's now he's still in the leathers. Now we've got uh, Mark Patton nude or half nude again. <laughs> What is that poster on the wall? Those <laughs> m- mostly nude it's... men. Keep in mind, Jack Shoulder says he knows nothing about he the, has the no gay overtones. Clue. No clue. To this day, 31 years later, has no had no clue whatsoever what the hell is going on. There's his Adidas shirt again yes. hanging on the thing. So I don't know. Maybe Adidas I slipping think... a couple dollars. 
Maybe got them in bulk, yeah. <laughs> and when I was a kid, I had no idea that there was... Oh, yeah. You don't realize it until maybe, like, your teenage years or whatnot that... Uh, something, I just... Something a little funny going on here. Right. And I always thought this was kind of an interesting little gag. You know, you've got mm-hmm. um, all of the, the sports equipment... Yeah. Coming, al- coming to life, as it were. Yeah. Um, and of Make course... a little thematic in a certain way. As an adult who knows the undertones of the film, all I see is this man <laughs> and all of his balls. <laughs> he's getting oh. pummeled with balls. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh dear. Oops. <clears throat> So, you know, clearly we're in a dream sequence here. Yeah. This is not reality. So, the point of how they got to the the school is moot. Mm Mm-hmm. But still kind of an interesting little gag. Again, we're not seeing Freddy. No. And even when we do see him later in the sequence, it's not Robert England. (laughs) Oh, Uh. dear. Oh, and here come the ropes. Now we've got bondage happening. Ah, yes. Um, this one, this is very reminiscent of, of the Tina scene in one. Hmm. I do remember being a kid and every time I was in a shower that had one of those heads, mm. I always kind of thought mm. back and like hoped that they wouldn't just ominously start turning on. <laughs> and Freddy just can't kill him. He's got to strip him naked and... Oh yeah. Here comes some more ass. Oh. And now we're whipping the man's ass with the towels. <laughs> oh, Jesus. To a bloody pulp. Oh. While he stands <laughs> there and watches in horror. Oh, now, this three, is a, this two, is kind one. of a cool it's little coming. fade. Yeah. Again, yeah. The, the fog or smoke yeah. reminiscent of the dream sequence. And, and not Robert Englund. That, that was so obviously not Robert Englund. And that could be anybody's hand, I don't know. Yeah. He scratched his back. It's not much. I don't it's know how It's not very can... definitive. And now we have... But this is nice. ...a reveal... Mm-hmm. ...where Jesse is Freddy. Scream, Queen. And that's obviously more the point of the scene. It really doesn't matter how convincing the death is. It's more about the psychological element going on with the character of Jesse. So you don't have to have it as elaborate of a death. It just has to get, get the point across. So perhaps he was sleepwalking? Is that... I'd have to imagine, because if that actually does happen to the gym teacher, why... why <clears throat> If it was all just a dream, <laughs> getting, right. uh, getting, getting my <laughs> the rules. head wrapped around, it's like they would both have to be in a conjoined dream for the ha- for it to be happening to Jesse and happening to the gym teacher. If it was just Jesse's own dream, how does the other guy end up getting dying if he's not actually if, physically involved with the dream? Right, that guy would have been the one to be having the dream, yeah. not Jesse. Right. So, again, we've we've really taken the rules and, and broken them in half. Yeah. And Jack Shoulders pretty much said that he didn't have... He, he, he understood why the first one was popular, but it really just never did anything for him. He wasn't really a fan of it, so... It's an interesting thing. It's like... I mean, Jack Shoulders was a trusted guy with the New Line Cinema, so I understand that. But also, you're getting a guy to make a sequel to a very popular and successful film for your studio who really doesn't have a lot of reverence for what Wes Craven did and really has a completely different approach to how to handle the material. So it's kind of contentious in that certain way. He's going to approach the film and kind of throw the rule book out and do a lot of different things. And of course, part of that is also the screenwriter in the film kind of twisting everything around as well. He needs a methadone clinic. What a great <laughs> line. Um, <laughs> here we go. Methadone clinic, excuse me. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> so good. There we go. He's wonderful. Um, and here we have the parents again. Uh, the theme of the parents thinking that they know what's best. Yeah. Um, although they do assume that he's on drugs. <laughs> it's a nice little twist, but it's the 80s. Sure. And why wouldn't he There's be? There's cocaine everywhere. Who cares? So here he's freaking out. He thinks... Did what I dreamed last night actually happen? Mm-hmm. So, okay. So then that tells me that he was at the gay bar, maybe? I don't, well, yeah. I don't know. Where, where, hey, we where we don't this... know where the dream actually began. I mean, you can say that's fairly... Uh, realistic in a certain way because sometimes you don't know where reality ends and you drift into unconsciousness and a dream begins and hello uh, born partial nakedness here. Um, I did notice um, in case just to go back to what we were talking about at the beginning there's a nice shot of his bulge uh, in case <laughs> nice framing on that um, that at the beginning, I said the bars were only across the top windows. Yeah. Clue was taking down the bars, and in that last, ah. the last shot of the the house at night, there were no bars at all. Mm. So obviously, they just moved in, and Clue has decided to take off the bars. Yeah. March is a bout of insanity. Sure. And now, obviously, we're dreaming again because we've got the yeah the knives in the drawer. Here is another. Uh flashback kind of wink and nod to the yeah. first film where we have the jump rope girls and it's nice, nice that they put this in here because it gives a, a little stronger context connection with the first film because if you're not going to have Bernstein's music this is probably the next best thing to throw in there and, it's, and it also gives you more of a visual motif instead of just a music cue and it's all haunting as shit too yeah that that is one of the scarier scenes in the film yeah, thus it's, far it, it just Atmospheric and haunting. Oh, more coffee. <laughs> coffee, coffee. Everybody likes it. <laughs> and he likes it black. Okay, now we're going to have some oh. exposition here. And another parallel where in the first film, Nancy accuses her mother of knowing mm -hmm. in the kitchen, standing right here, and mm -hmm. in this film, Jesse accuses him of knowing about things. And they just said, uh, Marge, insinuating that Marge killed herself in the bedroom. She just, yeah, Jesse just mentioned that. that Killed herself? Yeah. Of course, that's one person's perspective on sure, what happened. Sure, sure. Well, again, um, us having seen sequels, yeah. you know, let's take ourselves back yeah, to 1985. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to focus. Keep and it like three and four and, and everything else. At this point in the narrative, mm -hmm. if we're only looking mm -hmm. at one and two, that's what we know. This is yeah. what they've told us, that Marge yeah. is off herself. Which means that she then survived that dream from the first film. Only to... Do possibly, herself in. Possibly, I mean... Although, <clears throat> again, in, in sequels, you can just write whatever you want. Yeah, and, especially if you're not bringing back the same actors. Right. Fuck off. <laughs> you got it. And here's a scene coming up. You know, now they're... Okay, now we've got a mystery to solve. Yeah. And, and the kids are on it, like mm -hmm. a Scooby-Doo episode. <laughs> and um, I always really enjoyed this scene as a kid. Uh, just because... I liked the link to the first film, mm. and I thought, you know, oh, well, you know, what, what kind of ties can we create? Mm -hmm. And here, they've, they're going to the, the factory that Robert, you know, Fred Krueger worked at, yeah. or used to take his, his kids to mm -hmm. molest and or murder them. Yes. So this, you know, another so link... And this is expanding the mythology a little further, that giving a reason for the boiler room a little bit. Sure. Springwood Slasher arrested. <laughs> so now we've got a name. I do love uh, old news films that have old newspaper yeah. clippings. <laughs> it's such a, a good technique. Yeah. 
And, you know, I don't... It, they don't really know anything about him other than... Like, is Jesse just now learning who he was? Yeah. And this does not look like... A boiler... Like, what... The boiler room of what? This factory? Yeah. Like, they didn't say what this place was. Yeah, it just said it was a factory of some sort. Obviously been condemned or whatnot since then. It's like, why are these two able to just walk in there? Yeah. <laughs> they did say that it had been five years. I the thought t- that's what they said. The yeah. timeline of this film is that it takes place five years after the first one. Mm-hmm. But I can't imagine... Well, and we don't know how long yeah. it was from the death of Fred Krueger... Yeah. In real life, quote unquote. Not at this point in time of the franchise, no. And even later ones, I think, would be a bit uh, muddled in clarifying that. Sure. And there's just a cabinet that somebody leaned against something to, <laughs> for set decoration, and we'll make a plot line out of it. <laughs> it's got a little bit of scratches on the, oh, on yeah, the door, that's, too. Yeah, so that's a like, nice little touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and she's following him around like he's going to have some sort of... You know, she says, do you feel anything or do you he's, sense anything? He's going to have some kind of psychic awakening or something, you know? Which, I mean, how ridiculous is that? Yeah. He's wide awake. <clears throat> yeah. Oh. Uh. Just a road. <laughs> <laughs> and again, she's like clutching onto him and... She wants to be in his pants, and uh, and <laughs> he like obviously he's almost acting more terrified than he is, and he's the one who's been through right, all this shit. Right. Here's a nice little visual. This nice, nice steady little cam bit yeah. here. Way to go, Shaw. And it's just, <laughs> just kind of rocky enough to give you the idea that it's yeah, it's kind of is whipping around a little bit, kind of give you a little bit of disorientation. And it's the first real point of view shot that we've had. Yeah. And again, we go into the good little girl's room. Mm-hmm. And we have Freddie's voice. And once again, we have... <laughs> sweaty... Jesse. Sweaty Patton. <laughs> <laughs> Just... <clears throat> and he's once again mm-hmm. wearing the glove. Which appears to be the same glove. Oh, here, stay up, which is different than uh, the stay awake that Nancy used uh, in the first film. The, the new improved formula. Along with, with the, the new Coke. Uh, with the caffeine, yeah, with the caffeine and all that. <laughs> yeah, the bars are gone. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kind of a nice subtle thing. You don't really realize it in the first couple of times you watch it. Sure. And we get some more coffee. <laughs> Look him up with an IV or something with some uh, <laughs> dark roast. Yeah, s- sign me up. <laughs> so here she, you know, she's obviously concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, and there has been zero storyline at this point to indicate why he is not wanting to, like, there's no romantic scenes. Yeah, there's, there's no, scenes. yeah, they're not, he's not investing any interest or any kind of spark with her just like he's so right <clears throat> obsessed with what's going on with him you s- you set up you know this he looks like shit right now doesn't he the bags under his eyes yeah R- rustler has three milks on his drawer tray <laughs> yeah, he's got to build up that uh, protein <laughs> calcium <laughs> 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 Always been one of my favorite lines. I threw my grandmother down a flight of stairs. <laughs> and here she's begging him. Yeah. And he just zoned out, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> she's, you know, obviously begging him to help. He doesn't want anything to do with it. And he's not even telling her, really, that you know, mm-hmm. he's kind of become Freddy in at yeah. least two different dreams. 
Does that say Mr. Wonderful? Yes, it does. <laughs> He's got kind of a Jack Nicholson smile on him with the eyebrows and everything. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> oh, and some great clothes at this party, uh. too. <clears throat> so this is the big pool party. Dad's the DJ. <laughs> or try No, she doesn't want Dad to be the DJ this year. Yeah. Oh, well, he did show up, at More least. More Coke. Yeah, he's got like seven they, of them there at the They table. had to pay for something, man. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm thinking that you know, their budget was a little bit higher because maybe they got a couple sponsors. Yeah, maybe. Parents are going away. I mean, they could have just gone cheaper and gotten Tab or something, you know? Well, sure. <laughs> Nobody likes Tab. Nobody does. I get some a real crown, some RC Cola. I like RC Cola. It's all right. That guy doesn't look like he's in high school. <laughs> he looks like he's got some uh, odd things on his mind. <laughs> so she's going to, again, mm -hmm. try to force mm -hmm. something out of him. Yeah, I just, oh, yeah. I mean, he's getting the, getting the wild hair now, man. As the film goes on, his hair just gets more and more just like spiky and everything. Disheveled? Yeah. More and more like he got zapped with a taser or something. <laughs> and he, he very much likes to not be wearing a shirt. Yeah, just... <laughs> and I'm sure that that kind of thing wasn't in the script, per se. That it, that was more of a, a decision from the, the, the wardrobe, wardrobe department uh, and the director at yeah, the time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not that there were different directors, but... yeah. The mood of whatever scene. Yeah. Okay, so finally, mm -hmm. he's revealing something personal. Yeah, because I'm sure, like, with Jesse, he's, he's going through all this stuff, and like a lot of people in horror films, you don't want to tell a bunch of people about this stuff because they think you're just freaking crazy and want to commit you to a sanitarium or something. So you don't want to have, drive everyone away. You just want to kind of keep it locked up and hope it goes away or something. She just made the move. Yeah. I mean, this this is... His... I mean, knowing what we know now, yeah. this is so awkward to watch. <laughs> because I imagine that he's not having a good time right now. Nah. Let's think about Robert Rustler right now. And again... <laughs> You know, he's shown no interest whatsoever up until this point. So, you know, why all of yeah. a sudden he would be all in. Yeah, the logic doesn't form up from what they've shown us. I mean, you can obviously insinuate maybe all the uh, emotional stress he's been over, all over and someone's showing him some affection maybe kind of drives him to kind of embrace someone. But from what they've shown us in the film, they're just... There's been no spark of anything to kind of pull that forward. They're, they're just kids, <laughs> sir. <laughs> what did you think was going to happen? Yeah. You got 30 teenagers down there, and you just had to go and shack up in the bedroom with your... Right. <laughs> Somebody's boning decor. somebody at this party. Yeah. And he's trying to get into it. He's trying really hard. There's a good uh, cover-up of her yeah. boobs. Yeah, so that... little, little. give me a little bit of something, but not give me all of it. <laughs> and here comes a good, a good dream <clears throat> mm -hmm. tongue gag, even though ah. a little bit from the first with the uh, telephone gag, but more, sure. far more sexualized. And again, he wasn't dreaming. No. She's not dreaming. Nobody's dreaming. No. And, and, and obviously we'll get to the, the, the big egregious part of it, but just saying, what really is Freddy's need to inhabit Jesse to transcend into our reality? Right. What Why? benefit does that give him? It's like there's not a, a, a reason put to that. It's like that's a good psychological aspect of the film to put into it, but you don't really kind of give it a, a ultimate goal for him to really kind of have, have to want to do that. Right. He obviously showed throughout the entire first movie that he could go into anybody's dream. Mm -hmm. 
but now all of a sudden he needs this guy needs to ha- inhabit his body and in order to do his dirty work yeah just like and he picked him I mean if they added a few more elements carried on from what Nancy did at the end of the thing to kind of like defeat him take take his power away which is they, they revisit some of these concepts in later sequels and whatnot refashion them in different ways for like Freddy needing a vessel to kind of regain his power or something like that. They kind Which of, I always thought was stupid because yeah. the rules were set up in the first film and mm-hmm. he didn't need that. No. Here's another pretty classic scene. Yeah. Famous scene. And very well acted. And there's, there's the <laughs> you great line. with me. <laughs> I mean, it's even surprising that some of the actors just didn't speak. I was like, you, you realize what, what, right. what this scene is really kind of saying and whatnot, Jack? Right. <laughs> the, <laughs> wait, am I really... Cod, am no. I supposed to say that? <laughs> it's like, you might read it. It comes off a different way, but what you say is like, whoa, that's, that's really bizarre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, th- this, this scene is probably one of Mark Patton's best in the film. and just He's being very... Intensely haunted with this. Just ex- his expression. I mean, look at that. He's terrified. So this is reminiscent of the Nancy telling Glenn yeah. not to fall asleep yeah. scene. Which is... Like, it's almost, not word for word, but it's almost the same, exact same sentiment. Yeah. I'm going to go to sleep. You watch. If anything weird happens, wake me up. Yeah. Don't fall asleep. Mm-hmm. Here it is. Don't fall asleep. The only thing missing was the whatever you do. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of people wanting to have lots <laughs> of sex at this party. And more Coke again. <clears throat> more new Coke. Sure. In, in the, yeah, there, and why there's, is, there's no doubt. <laughs> why is the party almost dead right it's now? It's dead, yeah. Because Jesse left? It was bumping a minute ago. <laughs> and she's now going to leave her own house. There's not enough psychosexual tension going on in this party. It's like, it's, it's no good. <laughs> good 80s decor in this room. Yes, w- w- more wallpaper. They love more the wallpaper. Nice flying V guitar there, too terrible like art deco <laughs> 80s oh it looks like saved from the bell saved by the bell yeah it does <laughs> and now he says oh the kid's asleep i'm gonna go to bed yeah. how did he get in the room to begin with like how did he get in this house did the parents let him in <laughs> and how does freddie know exactly when to you know come into him I always like that line. Uh, oh, oh, this is this is a fantastic scene, f- effects wise. Yeah, agreed. And you know, kind of the the physical representation of mm-hmm. everything that has happened. Mm-hmm. Oh. Some great acting out of Patton here. Yeah. Oh, this is nice coming up here. Yeah, the blades coming out of the fingers. I mean, like I said earlier, I mean. With a lot of the effects that they use, there's some great visuals in the film. I'm mean, just using the psychological aspects of it. I'm just seeing this sort of shit. It's almost like something from a David Cronenberg movie. Just body I mean, horror all over the place. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really cool visual. Yeah. And the striped mm-hmm. sweater underneath, yeah. you know, that's kind of a, a cute little thing. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be coming through the stomach now here in a he moment. Can't, can't get out. Ah, Kevin Yeager's girlfriend's eye. <laughs> <laughs> oh. She's the only one who could fit inside the mold of the head to, That's to funny. make it happen. That's funny. <laughs> oh, here we go. More latex to do it. Robert Englund pushing through latex. Oh. I mean, I, this is cool. Some, this is freaky and shit. Although a really bad rubber face on it. Yeah, it, it's it's limited. 
and now he's <laughs> become Freddy. And that, I mean, this makeup is so different than yeah. the visual of everything from like three on. Yeah. Where you know when when people now yeah. think of Freddy, mm -hmm. <clears throat> he definitely looks more melted. Kinda, yeah. So to speak. Yeah, it was kind of kind of the idea Kevin Yeager had going with this one, just he wanted to make it more authentic to real burn victims to really kind of give it more of that kind of melted, uh, glossy look to it. No nerds allowed in this room, in case you missed that sign on the door. <laughs> and his father is played by the father of Ferris Bueller. I'm fairly certain <laughs> that this scene uh, was edited down. They they shot a much more gory... I wouldn't doubt it, especially with showing what you have on the chest there and everything. That's nice. Or Mary Gags. And here we have Jesse again. So now, once again... Jesse is Freddy. Mm-hmm. Kinda, sorta. But he. Uh... And now, now wait. Freddy came out of Mark Patton and split him in half. Yeah. Wouldn't now that he's mean? Back. He, now would that mean he's alive or dead? Now he's reconstituted, and then we have this mirror gag, which I like. Oh yeah. Oh, and and I love a good mirror gag. And in the mirror. Freddy has the blades coming out of his fingers, not mm -hmm. the glove, which... And then he's wearing a glove, mm -hmm. and... Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, they obviously made a, an effort to have the Freddy in the mirror be the representation of Patton becoming mm -hmm. Freddy. Again, this movie's so confusing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very twisting. I mean, it's like, does Freddy completely take over, and then he just relinquishes control of him, and then he just kind of goes back and forth as he chooses? I mean, it's... it's it's the fact that it, again, it takes the rules West set up in the first film, just kind of pushes them off to the side, but <clears throat> fails to convey what its new rules are. Sure. Whatever he wants to follow here, it's very loose in how it wants to use its concepts. And I feel like that is what really inhibits this from being a great film. Yeah. I mean, the gay stuff, whatever. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, again... You, you People get, lambast it for being, you know, like the gay nightmare film. Yeah. And look at all these gay undertones and whatever. Mm -hmm. And, like, okay, in today's day and age, mm -hmm. who cares? But I'm actually offended by the lack of rules. And, <laughs> You know, the way that people back then were offended by I mean, gay yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you go into stuff that has all these fantastical elements, you really have to set the parameters for how the story is going to fit into it all and how it's... Because you set rules that way you can weave the story around it. If you don't have rules, then you just go anywhere you want to, and it kind of creates a more looser context of the narrative. But at least you got a fantastic lead actor here that's just putting everything he's got into this role, making it all, all this emotional stretch just completely tear him apart, and it works so well. I mean, and again, tear him apart, that's literally, another, and, literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. So, I guess within the context of what he's going through in the mm -hmm. film, he's doing a brilliant job. Yeah. And it might, it might, I don't know if it is the most psychological of them all, but it certainly is a heavy emphasis on the psychology of the characters, going, at least for Jesse himself, the psychology of his character dealing with everything. It's not just metaphysical, it's very psychologically based about tearing his mind apart and everything, screwing with his head and trying to put himself back together in a certain way to be able to survive it. It's not just about staying strong, it's about having him have to deal with what Ferdy is doing to completely take him over instead of just trying to kill him. He's trying to use him as an instrument of destruction. Sure. But here we go. So now, in probably the most egregious um, point in the film as mm -hmm. far as rules and go, I guess. Which even the, Wes himself was very adamantly against. One of the things he really didn't like about what they were trying to do with the film was this scene. I mean... Oh, here's another link mm -hmm. to the past. Terrific. Yeah. Um, so, we've got the party now kind of coming to life. 
Mm-hmm. Doors are locking. Hot dogs are exploding. Mm-hmm. The pool is bubbling. Mm-hmm. And remind me again, who is dreaming right now? Nobody. <laughs> okay. Maybe the dog that's somewhere what, that's what next I door. <laughs> So, boy, I'm confused. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you took this script and not made a Nightmare in Elm Street sequel and just fashioned your own psychological Boogeyman. horror movie around it, it'd hold up better because it wouldn't have a presence set by a previous film. I agree with it that. It could hold up better as its own separate entity. I agree. This is definitely the Halloween 3 of, of the Nightmare franchise. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um, because interestingly, this film is never referenced ever again. No, nothing in it. Nothing. None of the Not characters, a character. none of the concepts, nothing really. This is a very scary thought right here. Oh, oh. And, and again. Transformed again. And Freddy Jesse mm. doesn't have a glove again in this scene. Mm. Um, he has the knives coming directly out of the finger. So I guess that's... Maybe that was something because they lost the glove part with your production. Ooh, I never thought of that. I always just thought it was kind of a the physical representation of it not being Freddy, quote unquote, but it being it Jesse, be. the embodiment of... But if the, but thinking back again, they were trying to get this thing out as quickly as possible, rushing through production. They didn't want to just shut down for a week so someone in fact could cr- construct a new glove. It could be something. It could. I never really thought of it. Yeah. But it's also, your way is also very fascinating because, again, we saw the knives coming out of Jesse's sure. fingers. If you want to reflect that as a as that being that, that's also a fantastic idea, too. And that's just how I always interpreted it. I never really thought of the production side yeah. and thought, well, that really looks like a rubber knife yeah. to me. <laughs> not Not very shiny. Everyone just standing there looking. I, very bizarre. It, it is. Everything it is. is bizarre. And look at how sweaty she is right now. They love that sweat. Uh. That is a rubber knife, yeah. if there ever was one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> 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 So yeah, I don't know. It's the whole thing is just weird. And he loves yeah. her. Yeah. Does he? I mean, they had I mean, one. They spent eighty percent of the film not connecting in any way. Sure. And then they have a start of a sexual encounter that goes wrong because of Freddy again. And now I love you. And now, right? Bizarre. I mean, you can understand what the idea is, but they don't execute it very well. Because, I mean, obviously, Freddy could have just gone ahead and just slash her up right there and be done with it. Sure. But possibly you got Jesse underneath there trying to wrangle some kind of control or whatnot. It Which could is be based on that. based on her suggestion. Yeah. That, that you he can could... fight it. Yeah. And then he just disappears through the window here yeah. as if, you know, oh, maybe it is a dream. Yeah. Like, either this stuff is happening or it's not happening. Yeah. Like, pick a lane, folks. Yeah. It's just so back and forth. Yeah. It, and willy nilly. It, it, it can't choose <clears throat> flip, flip flopping back and forth what it wants to do because, again, it doesn't set the parameters for what it wants to do. So it's just taking ideas and just slapping them on there and go whichever way it feels like going in the moment. Which is, ironically, how a dream would be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but for a narrative film, you have you to... You can't do it, right. You have to have... Have a structure. Something. Yeah. Y- you know, I don't even care what the rules <laughs> are, as long as you tell as long me as what you they have, are. you have some. You tell me what the rules and that, are. And that you yourselves know them. Sure. That's not just that you convey it, that... If they had rules and they just couldn't convey them well, that'd be one thing, but it just doesn't seem like they bothered to make any. Sure. 
And here's another interesting thing. He's now using fire. Mm-hmm. As the instrument a, of his own demise. Right. As a means. Oh, there's somebody who got their neck stuck. Oh. Oh, and a gut shot there. Yeah. Is he wearing a glove in this scene right here? I believe he it is. It kind of seemed like it. We need, a, we need a look at this. No, no, no he's, he's not. not. So this is Jesse, Freddy, and... Mm-hmm. And again, a much more... Uh, look at how much they're showing him yeah. and his face. Lighten him up a little bit, yeah. Yeah, let's reason with him. <laughs> reason with the guy with the razor fingers. Who just killed about like three or four people. Right. So, mm-hmm. <clears throat> again, he's using fire. Here's the very famous line. Yes, put it in the trailer too. But what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's just It's just a good line. It's just a good line for the trailer again. So, you'd think that he would be afraid of the fire, yeah? You would like, think so. Like he would not necessarily want Don't uh, shoot him. That's my boyfriend. <laughs> Yeah, the wonder if he did show what the hell would it do anyway? Sure. And now here yes. he's gonna disappear into the fire. Uh-huh. I like I don't. I don't exactly. Get it. Where did he go? What, what? What? What's? And is that Jesse? Where is Jesse still laying on the floor in the in the den? <sighs> I'm assuming mm-hmm. that everybody that's watching this commentary <laughs> with us has seen the film, obviously, at least once, and has probably come up with their, their own, these questions their own on their own. Their opinion of what, what, whether or not the film so, can, has any connection. I'd kind of like to apologize that we're just echoing your own sentiment <laughs> and not providing any sort of answers for you, but... We're trying to come up with some theories, <laughs> but, uh, again, the film lacks that cohesion in its concepts to really have it make that much sense. Because again, what <laughs> we're just running around in circles and we keep doing that, but I mean, what was the point of the previous scene? What does it really accomplish? And then you get to this scene, which is climax. It, it, there's there's no reason for it's freaky, right? Dogs with faces on them, yeah. Which is you know obviously a dream element. It stole that from Invasion of the Body Snatchers '78. To be honest with you, they <laughs> have a scene almost like that. But anyway, there's no reason for this scene to occur in waking life. This scene could entirely take place in a dream world. Right, which is And they climax. started the film with a dream sequence. Mm-hmm. They proceeded throughout the film in dream sequences. Mm-hmm. The later they got in the film, the less dream se- like it transitioned yeah. from all dream sequence to zero dream. And again, it it doesn't Again, convey a re- reason for what is it that Freddy can't do in the dream world that he has to go into reality to do it. I would think even if... Okay, so... Because at least in the dream world, if you're in the dream world, the only way to get out is to wake up. You can run as far as you want to. You're still in a dream world. In reality, you can keep running, get in a car, and run away from Freddy. Sure. It's, it's a less... A reality where he has less control over things from what we can tell from what they've offered us so far. If they had set it up where the dream, the person was dreaming and not Jesse, mm-hmm. the person B was dreaming mm-hmm. and then Freddy used Jesse in that person's dream as a vehicle, I feel like that would have been a rule that we could follow. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, the sister was dreaming. Ooh, bugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's gross. Yeah. Um, I don't like bugs. <laughs> um, the sister was dreaming, and he came in and put his hand on her. Um, mm-hmm. Perhaps if they had said that the the high school gym teacher was dreaming, mm-hmm. and Jesse was then the vehicle that killed him in, in mm-hmm. the coach's dream, mm-hmm. or if they'd have just let Robert Russler, Grady... Mm-hmm. fall asleep and shown him fall asleep for yeah. 30 seconds no 10 extra seconds yeah they needed to shoot 10 extra seconds have him fall asleep zooming in on him and you convey it <clears throat> right and now 
Grady's dreaming, mm-hmm. and he be- Jesse becomes Freddy and kills him. Yeah. Um, here, you could have had the parents fall asleep at the pool party, yeah. and Jesse becomes Freddy. And mm-hmm. but they didn't do that. Yeah. They have this. Yeah. <laughs> this. Uh, what context does these bizarre animals have within the film? So it's just there to, to elicit some kind of scare or whatnot. Sure, and you know to show that there's some sort of dream element. Mm-hmm. But nobody's dreaming. No one's dreaming. So they actually had the potential in every single one of these death scenes uh-huh. to convey that story. Yeah. And then they didn't. Mm-hmm. Which could have climaxed with her falling asleep. Mm-hmm. And this being her dream. Mm-hmm. No glove again. So he really did transition mm-hmm. into Freddy. Like it's it's obviously Jesse mm-hmm. <clears throat> slash Freddy slash Robert Englund. <laughs> and now he's gonna mm-hmm. fight to get out. Mm-hmm. So I mean it's it's really disappointing what this movie could have been. Yeah. I mean again, like I like I keep saying, the psychological elements are really strong, it's just Everything around it doesn't hold water. I mean, they, they've got some good tone going, got some good actors, good cinematography, good effects. Just the screenplay just doesn't click. It doesn't it's, lock it, into place. It definitely feels like a first draft yeah, screenplay. Again, they're, they rushed it out a ye- less than a year before the uh, release of the first film. And there's really no, you know, because there's no dream sequence, there's mm-hmm. no there's no way to get out of it. Yeah. You can't wake up. You can't do any of the stuff that you laid in the first film because, again, you keep running around in circles. Which they, then... They act, push that stuff out the door. Sure. And it actually just really almost um, dismisses the quality of the first film. Mm-hmm. The first film, as we discussed in that commentary, was yeah. so... Perfect on yeah. so many levels, and the, and they use surrealism so well to kind of warp reality a little bit. But this one just keeps driving it more narrow as it goes along. Because it started out with a nice kind of big set piece at the beginning of the film, and now it's kind of just, I mean, in a way, it kind of and it works in terms of making a more personal story. But in terms of the fantastical elements and utilizing the dream idea, it really just narrows its field as the film goes along. And how is this supposed to help? Uh, <laughs> it's certainly not attractive. No, <laughs> not at all. Oh, there's a little bit of emotion on Robert's face there. A little bit. And Jaeger's makeup is so... This is like the most different. Mm-hmm. In all, You can see all the gel on the pipes. Oh, yeah, Come yeah. on. Oh, when they made this, they expect to be watching... Most of this on grinny ass uh, VHS analog in- well, at images this... and everything. Now you got an HD. It's like you can see every imperfection that they had on this. Even though they had more budget, it's still a low budget horror film for the eighties. I agree. And we really weren't even in mm. the height of home video at this point. No, it was still a few years down the road. So I mean, again, another fantastic melting effect here and. And more fire, because earlier he's using fire to his advantage. Now it's now it's destroying him. Sure. So even those types of visual motifs, they don't add up. Aren't consistent. So again, I'd like to apologize that your frustrations <laughs> and our frustrations <laughs> are the same frustrations. <laughs> and but I I know some people who really do appreciate this film a lot because of again performances and the psychological aspects of it and I'm very much someone who's kind of in the middle on this film as I've talked about in previous things that I don't think it's a terrible film it has good ideas has some I think Jack Shoulder on other films he's done he's been a solid director so it's not like they got a bad director for it but they just they didn't take enough time to really develop it well and I don't think they really just got a handle on what they really what really made the first film work 
obviously what it's saying. Well, like, what made the first film work was yeah, Wes Craven. Wes, <laughs> mainly. And then they want to get replace Robert Englund with some random stunt guy, and that didn't work. So they kept trying to... They kept second-guessing what really worked. And they never really pinned it down with this film. I don't know how anybody would like sit through a table read or whatever. I mean, even Bob Shea, mm. who, again, is probably just so interested in making money at this point. Yeah, you, because his company was you know, almost non-existent. Yeah, I mean, if this film wasn't successful, New Line wouldn't have survived. Or at least not in the fashion that it did. So, you know, he says, oh, I, I need to grab this money while it's still coming in. Yeah. Let's it take any old strike thing. Strike the iron's hot. But, like, nobody down the line of from top to bottom said, hey, maybe we should think about some of these yeah. chal- problems. And yeah. I mean, and it wasn't even until they were, like, partway through production and Robert Englund sitting there on set, especially when they're doing the pool party scene, realizing that it just doesn't feel right. This doesn't work, but now it's too late to do anything about it because... You've already well, invested all this money. You're right. already in the middle of it. You're done. You're, it's, you're screwed. It's over. Yeah. You're too. You're too far along. And here we've got the bookend again. Yeah. The comebacker, as it were. Mm-hmm. So, oh, even the shot of them coming out the front yeah. door and it's daylight. There's a lot of little homage. Yeah. There's Glenn's house across the way. Ah. Uh, no mention of. I wonder if they cleaned all the blood off the ceiling yet. <laughs> right. Did somebody buy that house? I can't imagine his parents are still there. Well, they said it took five years just to sell this one. Sure. I mean. Oh, so now they're. That neon green shirt. Oh, Christ. it's wonderful. Why doesn't it have <laughs> buttons though? <clears throat> just like a like a poncho or something. <laughs> Those are terrible earrings mm. on both of them. So it's like Jim or something like that. <laughs> Jim and the holograms. So of course we've got another jump scare coming. Mm-hmm. That is not Robert Englund. That's not Bob Englund. No. So again, they're mm-hmm. they're even in the very end. They're saying, "I don't really know if it's a dream or not." Yeah, it's like, and at this point. What does it They're matter? They're still trying to do the hook at the end like they did the first film. They right. went against what West wanted to do, make it more definitive. They still want to make, make it open for another sequel. Don't want to, No point do they ever want to say Freddy has been defeated. Sure. They want to leave it open. Which they could still do without incorporating the main characters. They could add in, they could have a supporting character or something like that or whatever it is. Pop up at the end of the film, but... New Line would continue to do this, even like with the Final Destination films. At the end of the film, they got to have a stinger, got to have something else that kicks it back upon you. They can't just say it's over. It's a horror film. There's got to be a hook at the end. Well, and again, in the first one, they didn't intend on there being yeah. a sequel. No glove on the hand no. coming through. And this just drives off in the distance. We don't get any more than that. We just get the laugh. Mm-hmm. Freddy's still alive. Um, and we don't know what happens to these characters, so... We know nothing. We know that the song, uh, the Touch Me All Night Long song is awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, we... Pooh Gurla Gur is awesome. Awesome, sure. Hope Lang was, you know, a big name at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Edward Blackoff. That's an interesting best, name. Best. Uh, <laughs> Hart is the, that gentleman's first name. That's an interesting Hart's first name. Uh, and there's a Jonathan Hart. Lots of mm-hmm. hearts. Uh, barbecue Boy, Robert Chaskin. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, anyway, so ultimately, uh, did I assume that that Chaskin was David Chaskin's kid, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, just as a little, hey, get in my film. Yeah, um, why not? Did Freddy get revenge? <laughs> I, I don't think he did. I don't know who got what out of this movie. <laughs> Except for a paycheck. I mean, it's really just a... I mean, what a bad pun, but this film's a nightmare <laughs> from, from front to back. It's just a mess. And it wouldn't be the last time in this franchise where they rush a sequel out. Sure. It's like, we gotta get it out, and they keep trying to get it out within a year of the last film. Oh, wait till part five. Oh, Christ, no money. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I guess I'd like to thank everyone for coming along on this terrible journey with us. Absolutely. As, as much as I dislike I, the film, I still I still love it, but I love to hate there's, it. There's stuff to give credit to, but there's also stuff that really doesn't uh, deserve credit. Yeah. 
Um, so <laughs> I guess uh, be on the lookout for Mark Patton's documentary about being gay in Hollywood. Indeed. Um, I've I actually participated. It was a crowdfunded deal. Cool. Um, I, I helped participate in that. Um, so at some point I'm going to get a copy of it. Cool. Uh, so that'll be that'll be fun. Um, and hopefully down the line here we can get to. Uh, We'll see everybody for part three. Dream <laughs> Warriors, baby. Docking. Oh, it's going to be a wonder. Oh, touch me all night long. There it is. Oh, yeah, baby. Some, it's, it's worth the price of it. Go to iTunes and download that song yes. just for the sake of... Yeah. I mean, we don't want anybody to get credit you know, for it. We just like it. Mm-hmm. I, I might. I have it on my iPod. I just. I know that. <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, good times. Good Copyright times. 1985. The, the second, second Elm Street, Street Venture. Venture. It's always weird with these things like they, they just create these new production companies just for a sequel. <laughs> and you never hear from them again. <laughs> Elm Street Part 2. Well, well, thanks guys for listening. We enjoyed uh, you guys checking things out. And like we said, Dream Warriors in a couple of weeks. Coming soon. Can't wait. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.